in other salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لأها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا جاء نصر الله والفتح 
ورأيت الناس يدخلون في دين الله أفواجا فسبح بحمد ربك واستغفره إنه كان توابا صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على رسول الله وآله الأطهار على رسول الله وآله الأطهار صلوات Again, for those who just walked in, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I welcome you all to the Islamic House of Wisdom where we are, we have our Ramadan nightly program. I believe we are on night, what is it, nine, ten, nine, nine days. So we're one third of the way done with Ramadan. Couple announcements. We have tomorrow with Hajj Hassanin, inshallah, we have at 11.30, Suhoor with a Scholar. Inshallah, so after the English lecture, around 11.30, inside the masjid, we'll have like a Q&A session with the Hajj. And uh, also, for Eid, Eid al-Fitr, of course, we have a Eid festival. So look out for the flyer on that. Um, it'll be out soon. Follow us on our socials, at Youth of Wisdom, on Instagram, Facebook. We have a WhatsApp group chat as well. You can, there's a QR code when you walk inside the masjid where you can... Uh, scan that and you can join the group so you are in the loop for all our events. I don't want to take too much time. So with that said, I'd like to invite Hajj Hassanin Rajab Ali to the podium with three loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Fatiha. Bismillah. Allah the Beloved, the Rajim. Bismillah, the Rahman, the Rahim. Alhamdulillah, the Rabbil Alamin. Alhamdulillah, the Ladi Hadana Lihada, the Ma Kunna Linahtadi Alaula Hadan Allah. الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين ما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا استعينوا بالصبر والصلاة إن الله مع الصابرين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد صلى الله all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we thank him for this blessed month of Ramadan, the month of forgiveness, the month in which we reflect, meditate, evaluate ourselves and the value of what we're doing on this earth. While this life on this earth is very short and Allah says the hereafter is eternal and forever and it's much better for in that, in that life we don't age, we don't become old, we don't become sick. There will be no stress, there will be no gossip, there will be no nonsense talk, there will be no danger, there will be no fear, and there will be so much pleasure that Allah says you have no idea what awaits you if you are to be patient on this earth and struggle just a little bit and hold back those negative qualities just for enough time till you leave this world. And thank God we have the month of Ramadan with fasting 
And fasting, while it's physical, it's aimed to strengthen our spirituality. And I know that since childhood, when, I've been, when I was fasting, it helped me a lot in my high school, in my university years, in my adulthood, because it enabled me to say no to things that I knew were bad. But because we were fasting and because we were taught to abstain from the basic necessities of food and drink, just from sun, sunrise to sunset, which some people think it's a daunting task, it is not. It is not difficult with all due respect. I think it's elegant, it's beautiful, and certainly we will miss it. One third of Ramadan has already passed us. And I think it's very sad because it's moving very quickly. And I'm afraid personally whether or not I will capture the spirit of this month sufficient enough to be able to become a better person before next Ramadan, should Allah give me life then. Tonight, I'd like to spend some time, being that it's the 10th night of Ramadan, technically. And as you know, there was a great historical event that took place in the month of Ramadan in the year 619 AD, roughly three years before the Messenger of Allah migrated from Mecca to Medina. Two of the greatest supporters of the Holy Prophet وسلم, were taken away from this world. His two most beloved beings were taken away from this world. First, it was his blessed wife Khadija bint Khwailid, and the second was, of course, Abu Talib. Uh, and as you know, that these two personalities were the greatest supporters of the Holy Prophet besides Imam Ali. Salam. So we need to spend some time to know, because also in this month of Ramadan, as we get closer to additional nights, you will see that we will talk about the great battle, which was the Battle of Badr. These are important historical events for us to know, because while we are pre preparing ourselves to become better human beings, we must understand what happened in history that gave Islam the strength that it did. Who were the helpers of the Prophet? What did they do for the Prophet and with the Prophet so that I can emulate a little bit? What lesson can I take from those who loved him, those who followed him, those who were married to him and those who were his companions and his relatives? How much can I learn? I think history is very important. I advise us all, especially our young generations, of course the older generation, we should. We should know our history, our basic history. I know that in my university, just a quick example, when I started being challenged by Christians, and Christians were coming to my door and you know, trying to convert me to Christianity, uh, and I engaged them very openly with, a, with an open heart, because I felt that if they feel that they have the truth and they really want to share it with me, I think that's very nice. It's like if somebody knows they believe to be the truth, and they come to your door and they want to share it, then it's very nice. I appreciate that, even if it means conversion of some sort. Now, I want to give also advice. I've heard some of our Muslim brothers and sisters, with all due respect, leave Islam and become Christians. Honestly, I scratch my head like, how? How, how could you even go there? I mean, my God, what a, with all due respect, what a degradation. It's not an upgrade. Islam is the ultimate religion in the world. And I say this even in churches, even among Jews and Christians. And I respect them. But I tell them, the Tawheed that we have, the oneness of God, the sublime nature of God in the Quran mentioned about His mercy and how He deals with His creations and how He addresses Jews, Christians, Sabians, and Muslims all in one sentence. Which religion does that? Which religion gives everybody the benefit of the doubt except Islam? Which religion has the purest of Tawheed? Which religion has the best prophets who do not commit sins? Which religion has the best scripture? With all due respect, read the Bible, read the Torah. With all due respect, and I'm not bashing any religion, with all due respect, please, please, don't even think about it. And if you think of that, maybe there's another reason why you converted. But when they came to my door, they asked me some very interesting questions, and I started to learn. And subhanAllah, because they were questioning me, and they were saying, you are a Muslim, tell us about your religion. Now, most of them would never ask me that because they never want to hear my Islam. They'll put their hands on their ears, in fact. If you tell them, okay, let me tell you what the Quran says. No, no, we don't want to hear it. 
Right? They would say that. I said, why, why don't you want to hear it? Why should I hear yours? You should hear mine too. Since you brought the Bible to me, I should bring the Quran to you. I think it should be reciprocal. We should share. I think we should share equally. The reciprocity is, you want to guide me. I also want to guide you. I think that's fair. Now, if you think I'm really lost, inshallah, you will guide me. Right? But for a human being to think that they are not lost, no problem. Bring your burhan. The beauty of why I'm explaining this is that when they came to my door to convert me, I used to sit with them. I, used to, I even used to go to Bible study twice a week. They really thought I was going to become a Christian. I said, I'm ready. I have absolutely no qualms in accepting any religion besides the religion I have. If you can convince me, it's the religion of truth. Allah says, go study. Go invite them. Have a dialogue. قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَنْ لَا نَعْبُدَ إِلَىٰ اللَّهِ Come, let's have a dialogue that we worship none other than God. And my paradigm when I went through my teenage years was does God exist? And if he exists, what kind of a God should exist? What, a kind, what kind of a God can never exist? These are fundamental questions that we have to delve with so that we know Allah properly. Then we will know ourselves better. So I sat with them and I heard their stories. And I said, look, Jesus is saying, why callest thou me good? There is none good but that which sent me. People said, Jesus, thou art good. Jesus, you are good. Jesus says, don't call me good. There is no good but the one who sent me. So if he is God, why is he saying that? Jesus prayed. Who did he pray to if he is God? These questions I asked very generally. And they would look at me and say, well, don't ask those questions. I said, why should I not? Tell me about the Trinity. It doesn't make sense to me. How can three be in one and one in three, yet three distinct differences? One is communicating with the other and one is less than the other. And then a third of it died? Please, don't confuse me. In time, they asked me and I realized and somebody came to me on the sidelines after this dialogue. They said, tell me about your prophet. Subhanallah, look. Here I am a Muslim having gone through Islamic schools as a child, but you know, basic knowledge, basic Islamic knowledge. I just had a fundamental understanding of what was truth. And if truth was supposed to be there, it needs to be intrinsic, meaning everybody must accept it. Whether it's your friend or your enemy, they must accept it. For example, to say to lie is bad. Everybody must accept it. That, that must be intrinsic truth. That must be fundamental truth. That's the kind of truth that cannot be debated. Nobody will debate that to lie is good. It's fundamental, right? Even a liar will tell you it's not good to lie. That fundamental truth, I built them. A whole series of them that were what we call indisputable truths. And I knew that my adversary, whoever was against me, believed in the same thing. Because universal truth is shared by everybody. And I used that as my foundation. When I ask the questions about divinity and about God, about the oneness of God and about the mercy of God, I built it on the basis of fundamental truths. And they couldn't challenge me because it was very difficult. They were trapped. Because the minute I asked them questions about how can God die, how can God be born, it doesn't make sense. We understand the fundamental truths of the divine principles and explain this. So they couldn't. And I realized, wait a minute, the Qur'an is so natural with its fundamental truths. The Qur'an is just naturally flowing. It's questioning my integrity and letting me question it and letting me go into it and letting me travel and go and question people and dialogue with people. Wow, what a religion that encouraged me, encourages me to be more knowledgeable, to be more uh, broad-minded, to travel and go study other religions. This religion is not myopic. This religion is very broad. And it's encouraging me to learn. So when my Christian brethren and atheists and non-Muslims ask me questions, they said, tell us about your prophet. I said, well, he was the last prophet, you know, 124,000th prophet. God sent the first one as Adam. But then I realized I really don't know much about the holy prophet. I don't know his history. I'm a Muslim. I've learned a little bit about the prophet, but I don't really know him very well. And it dawned on me that I'm a Muslim and my shahadatain insists that la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And without Muhammadur Rasulullah, I'm not a Muslim. If I say la ilaha illallah without Muhammadur Rasulullah, I'm a muwahid, I'm a believer in one, but I'm not a Muslim. A Muslim 
demands two things. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, right? Two shahadatain you must recite to be considered a Muslim. And by the way, once you understand this, wilaya, Amir al Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, the 12 Imams, this naturally flows. Day of judgment naturally flows. Everything starts to flow once you understand the dynamics of Tawheed and Nubuwa. Right? Ma'ad automatically, and Allah gives us those examples. Inna ladina aman wa ladina hadu wa nasara wa sabi'in man amana billahi wal yawm al akhir wa amila salihan. Right? Allah says, indeed, the believers, the Jews, the Christians, the Sabians, provided they believe in one God and the day of judgment and do good deeds, for you there is no fear. Don't worry. I said, wow, what a sentence. What a sentence from God, including all the major religions on earth within my sentence. And God is laying it in front of me and in front of my Christian brother and says, here, all of you, this is the condition. That as long as you have these parameters. Here Allah says, belief in Allah, day of judgment. There's no mention of the Holy Prophet because that's the framework of Husul al-Din. Within that framework, it's natural that Nubuwa comes in. And within the framework of Nubuwa, it's natural that Wilaya in Imama comes in. Anybody who has a problem with the Imamat, meaning the Imamat of Ali ibn Abi Talib, which unfortunately quite a population has issues with it, with all due respect, just like as I mentioned with Christianity and Islam, Wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen is the most natural consequence equivalent to talking about the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And I say not because I'm a Shia. I am a Shia because it's sensible. Not any other way. Let me say that very clearly. If this issue of Wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen was not sensible and not authentic, and not real, I would not be proclaiming it. I'd be a fool. Why should I proclaim something that's not true? I'm the one who dies alone, and I'm the one who's going to go into the grave alone, and I'm the one that has to answer Allah to my own foolishness. Why would I want to fool myself? The wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen is the most, one of the most incredible gifts Allah has given us. And any one of us who has a problem with it, with all due respect, and you're debating with Christians about the oneness of God, please step up to the plate and, and accept the common sense. That while we use common sense with Christians, let's continue to use it within Islam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. When my Christian friends and non-Muslim friends would ask me, who's, the prof who's your prophet? I said, I didn't know very much. I felt ashamed. And look how Hidayah comes. I remember I was in Africa and I was lecturing. Somebody says, Subhanallah, you were born here. This is a predominantly Muslim country. You went to a non-Muslim country. You grew up there and you came to teach us Islam. Wow, that's amazing. You went to New York. New York, you know, is known as the great city of New York, right? Some people call it the sin city, but it's not. It's a great city. And you find out oh, you went to America and you came back to teach us Islam? I said, yes. How? I said, the non-Muslims taught me Islam. They questioned me correctly. They invited me. They engaged me. There were no innuendos or, you know, what we call uh, any kind of blasphemies. We talked freely. When an atheist asked me about the existence of God, it was a free conversation. And I liked it. Because it brought me closer to Allah. When I debated Dan Barker and Richard Carey, people said, oh brother, you know, what if you, you lose your faith? I said, lose my faith? After watching the atheists talk to me, my faith doubled towards Allah. Because I knew what kind of lies they were pro propagating that were absurdly ridiculous. And Allah says, watch the ridiculousness of their arguments. That how, how dare you even go in that direction? If you look at the Quran, 95% of the Quran talking about Allah is about polytheism, shirk. It rarely touches on the issue of atheism. Because the Quran is saying there's no need to talk much about that. It's common sense. But polytheism can be confusing. Because we humans want to grab Allah, we want to hold Him, we want to hug Him, we love Him. So therefore we make shapes of Him. This is where the Christians went astray. Christians went astray because they love God so much, they wanted to humanize Him. They wanted to make him into some kind of a, 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 a reincarnation and give him some body shape to look at. Whereas Allah says you cannot. If you want to look at me, look at my creation. Go to the Kaaba, go to Safa and Marwa, go to the Holy Prophet, read the Quran, look at Ali ibn Abi Talib. They are all Sha'ir Allah, Allah says. These are my signs, these are my ways to, to me. 
but don't defy me through a shape and form. And unfortunately, Hinduism, Buddhism is non-theistic, but still, they kind of bring Buddha into the divine power. And then if you look at Christianity, with all due respect, you find that this deification of Christ as the Son of God is a mistake due to their desire to want to touch in a focal point of some sort to touch a god. Hindus, as you know, have millions of gods. But that's the problem. Allah is beyond that. And no religion in the world maintains its stance in its purest form than Islam. And the Quran is the only book in the world that maintains the perfection of the beauty when Allah says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid, wa lam yulad, wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. This surah in the Quran, Surah Al-Ikhlas, you'll find it starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Say Allah is unique, ahad, not wahid, ahad. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, Allah is independent. Lam yalid, he does not beget. Wa lam yulad, nor is he begotten, meaning he nor is he born. He doesn't give birth, nor... Is he born of anyone? And there is no comparison to him. You cannot compare anything in the universe with him. That uniqueness of Surah Al-Ikhlas is profoundly beautiful, sufficient for you and I to understand. And that's, by the way, what gives us trajectory towards the right religion. Because the minute you adulterate God and you give him a son, or he dies, or he has some kind of a game, then you start going into Greek mythology, like Zeus, and the gods are very jealous of each other, or the Hindus who's, you know, who are jealous of the you know, god called Brahma, so they cut his head off, you know, and stuff like that. All of this stuff will start coming out. The minute you make God into some carnation, some kind of a anthropomorphic shape, you're doomed. Because now you've limited God, you have shaped him, you have stepped on him, you've used him, and you will abuse him. What happens is the minute you use and abuse Allah, the laws of Allah start to go out the window, and haram becomes halal, and halal becomes haram. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So when my Christian friends asked me, who is your prophet? Tell us. And I felt the duty that I'm in the university, here I am, and I have an opinion that yeah, at least I should have a backing. So I advise us all, this was just my point to make, that please, learn your history. So I didn't know much, so I went to a great person, may Allah rest his soul, Sayyid Asghar Radhawi. He has written the book on Khadijat al-Kubra, he's written the book on restatement of Islamic history. He spent decades, 30 years, writing this book. And this man was a man of God. And he lived in New York, he had come in the 60s, and he used to go to churches and mosques and talk about Allah. And he was a lover of Ahlul Bayt, and actually he's a Sayyid from the Prophet's family. And I knew him, and he was an erudite, a very learned man, very simple, very humble, very beautiful human being. And at that time, in the 70s and in the 80s, we didn't have Google, we didn't have computers like we have today. And in, in seventh grade, for example, I debated my teacher. My teacher said Islam is a religion of violence. The, the prophet of the Muslims would go door to door and behead people. This was my seventh grade teacher. I was 12 years old, and my teacher in, in, in New York said that. I raised my hand and said, excuse me, I have never heard of this. I'm a Muslim. Now, I was the only Muslim in, in, in school. I said, I've never heard of this nonsense that you say that the prophet killed people. What nonsense is this? He said, it's written in the books. I said, okay, you get your books, I get my books. And we'll figure out who's right. Because I wasn't going to let him pass. I am 12 years old. Something about me just is itching that this man has lied and I'm not going to let him pass. And this professor, I mean, this teacher was teaching for 30 years in the school. She was a very seasoned teacher. But subhanAllah, the lies that are perpetuated in public schools against Islam until today are incredible. You wonder why these leaders who become leaders who are half-witted brains who think very little of Islam, it's because they've been indoctrinated with false ideas for decades. And we need to stop that by our mouths and ourselves and our actions and our transactions and our wisdom and our knowledge. And we need to educate them. As Allah says, go teach them. Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Don't be afraid of them. Now, I'm growing up in America in the 70s. Okay? And here I am in school. And I'm challenging my teacher. And I'm saying to this teacher, you're wrong. Now he says, okay, then you bring your books. So I get out of class and all the kids were excited because, you know, they, they love debates. I didn't even know what books to read. Where do I start? What do I do? What book should I bring to this man? Because I know for a fact 
because I, I knew the Quran, of course, I knew the Prophet, I understood Islam. And I said, but where do I start? Subhanallah. I picked up the phone and called this man, Sayyid Asghar Radwi. I said, Sayyid, can you please help me? I have a debate with my teacher on this issue. He said, sure, no problem. Bring a pen and paper, write the following down. I was on the phone with him. And he says, Sir William Muir, page this, paragraph this, read this. Sir John Glubb, famous historian, the British historian, page this, paragraph this, read this. I mean, I wrote it down. Look at the ni'mah this man gave me. I went to the library near my, in my neighborhood. There was an old lady sitting in the back in rare books, because these were rare books. These are not common books. This old lady says, you are a 12-year-old. What are you doing here? I said, I came to research. She said, wow, I don't see kids your age come and research. I said, no, I'm excited. I'm going to find the truth. So she said, yes, all these books are available. She, go, she picked them all out for me. And subhanAllah, I opened the page, and there it was, exactly verbatim what he told me. This man was an erudite. He was learned. But look at the rahmah that my teacher made a wrong statement. He pulled me to learn. You, you see the point? When, when you get engaged into some dialogue and somebody says Islam is a bad religion, your prophet was a bad person, don't take umbrage to that. Don't get angry with it. Just look at them and say, okay, let's have a dialogue. Maybe I will learn more and maybe you will learn more. And maybe tomorrow because of this argument, we will both become better. And I've had cases in mind where people have challenged such cases and they became Muslims as a result. I have so many cases of people, personally, besides what's on the internet, of people who have degraded or what we call castigated or bad-mouthed Islam who then became Muslims themselves. So many in my life. And Allah says that's what haq is. قُلْ جَعَ الْحَقُ وَزَحَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَحُوكَ Truth is prevalent. Go after it. Don't be afraid. So this man gave me strength. He said, go pick up these books. I picked them up. Then I also did my own research. And Time magazine showed statistics that Islam was the fastest growing religion in the world statistically. And that Christianity was on the decline, actually. In the Christian world, Christianity was dropping. So I took these statistics, and then I, my professor was Jewish. And I studied Jewish history briefly. At that age, I went and I read about because uh, my brother said, uh, said, Asghar said, study the golden age. You will know where the argument lies. So I went and I started reading about the golden age. It was when the Muslims ruled the Jews in Spain, it was the golden era. He said, go study and see how much the Muslims enabled the Jews to spread their religion freely without persecution. Unlike Queen Isabella, who persecuted Christians and forced them to become, I mean, who persecuted Jews and Muslims and forced them to become Christians. Not us. Us Muslims, we never did that. It was not allowed. So I read the stories of the golden age. Then I was ready. The next day I went to school and I put the books on his desk and he had no books. So he was visibly annoyed because he felt that I was just bluffing him. I told him, no, I'm serious. And he didn't want to continue. I says, no, Mr. Birnbaum, we're going to continue this conversation, and I want to finish this. And the kid said, yes, we want to know. So here now I'm educating 27 kids in school in my class because there were 28 of us. And I was the only Muslim. The point of the matter is that when a non-Muslim challenges you, even with false statements, get educated and then come and dialogue properly and if they refuse, leave them alone and tell them, I bear witness, I'm a Muslim, and walk away. Don't be afraid. Allah has noted. And subhanAllah, I, I, I say to Mokia, well, let's see. Sir John Glob says the following, that Muhammad was a man of peace and that he never killed anybody. And in fact, he was very merciful to people. Sir William Muir, who had a lot of animosity against Islam. In fact, Sir William Muir did not like Muslims. He didn't even call us Muslims. He called us Muhammadans. Because he knew the name Muslim was very powerful. He wanted to put us like themselves, Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Muhammadans. No, we're not Muhammadans, we're Muslims. Our name, is religion is Islam, we are Muslims. So he used to call us Muhammadans. But even then, he writes that the Holy Prophet was a great man. That he was a man of peace. And then I asked Mr. Birnbaum, I said, you know, if a man comes to my door and puts a knife on my neck and tells me become a Muslim, would I? Of course I would, because I'd be afraid. But do you think I will remain a Muslim when the knife is gone? When the sword is gone? Would I? 
He looked at me. Well, I said, you know, Islam is the fastest growing religion. Ask all these people who are becoming Muslims. Do they see a sword on their necks? In fact, the Quran has no word called sword in it. The entire Quran does not have the word sword in it. Do you know that? They say Islam was spread with the sword. But the word sword should be mentioned in the Quran. What size it should be, how sharp it should be, what materials you should use, what color it should be. Because at the end of the day, that's our way of spreading Islam, right? So give me what the sword should look like. There's not a word safe in the Quran from cover to cover. He was stunned by it. I said, but the Bible has it. But I'm not going to point a finger there. I said, statistically, you're a Jew. You had a golden age. And it was the Muslims who let you spread your religion. He felt so embarrassed after that. But subhanallah, I had a teacher who guided me, who gave me some level of guidance and told me, go learn your religion a little bit if you claim to be a Muslim, even if you're 12 years of age. When I graduated from that school in ninth grade, because that school did not have a high school, just ninth grade was the last grade, and I had my cap and gown and I graduated. And as I'm leaving, in his office, I passed by, he called me, he says, come here. So I went. I stood in front of him. He said, nobody has insulted me in 30 years like you have. I said, Mr. Birnbaum, you insulted me. You insulted my religion. And I just want you to know that from now onwards, there's going to be someone like me in every classroom of yours that's going to straighten you out until you tell everybody the truth. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. That was when I was 12. Now when I reached my university years, you find that these people are challenging me. I went back to Sayyid Rizvi. I said, Sayyid, I want to know the Prophet. He said, I will guide you. He gave me a book by Muhammad Hussein Haikal. Haikal is an Egyptian historian. He's from Al Sunnah wal Jama. He said, read his book. He's a prolific writer. He's a very good writer. Study him. It's better. Some of the issues are Sunni uh, based, but doesn't matter. History is 95% intact. Go study him. So he gave me the book himself. He underlined all the key words. SubhanAllah, this man was an erudite. What a mercy. May Allah rest his soul. He's gone. I came back to the university, and this was that era which my historical love, love for history, started to grow. I was in a triple, so it means I had two other roommates in my room, and I was sleeping in a bunk bed, and my bunk bed was the lower bunk bed. My roommate, Dave, you know, the one with the blue-eyed blonde hair, he was above me, sleeping. And there was another roommate next to me. I put a curtain around my bed. I actually put a curtain and I put a little light. Because I didn't want to be disturbed. And every day after class, after I'm done doing my homework and all of that, I would go to Mecca and be with the Prophet. And here I am. And as he's talking, I'm crying. And I'm saying, yes, I, I, I felt like I was his companion. I was with him. And I was crying. Sometimes I was laughing. Sometimes I was crying. And then when the chapter ends, I go back and say, ah, I wish this chapter didn't end. I, I want to hear more of it. Then I go to the next chapter. It's a, it's a thick book. It's 600 pages. Very thick book. But what happened is I said, subhanAllah, I love this so much. I fell in love with the Prophet. That for the first time, the man that I said, Shahadu anna Muhammad Rasul, was starting to come into my heart. So I advise us all, brothers and sisters, if we're going to get closer to Allah, and we want to purify ourselves, gain knowledge, and understand the gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We didn't send you except as a mercy for all. رَحْمَةٌ لِلْعَالَمِينَ لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Allah is constantly telling me how great this Prophet is. Allah says, if you want to purify yourself, how will you do it if you don't know this man? How will you follow the ways of Islam if you don't understand who he was and what he went through and the trials and tribulations of his life? How would you know? So I advise us all tonight, briefly, that please take some time. And I read that entire book, cover to cover, carefully. And I felt so in love. I felt I was in Mecca. I felt I was in the cave. I felt I was in Medina. I was on the battlefield with the Prophet. And I cried when he was on his deathbed. And as he's dying, I'm crying. I'm literally wiping tears. Because as he's talking, I, I can feel him. I can touch him. That effect is beautiful. And tonight, we want to touch on Khadija bin Khawili, his wife. You find that the Quran talks about this. And talks about womanhood. And I started with Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 155. <laughs> وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ يُقْتَلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتٌ بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ 
ولكن لا تشعرون ولنبلونكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات وبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون أولئك عليهم صلوات من ربهم وأولئك هم المحتدون This verse touched me when I read it the first time I felt so in love with it I recited it all the time till it became part of my ethos my thought patterns the verses became my thought patterns that every time I have an issue I remember just the verses become part of you it becomes your friend just like the history of the Prophet became my friend and I remember by the way after reading that book I had the most incredible dream where something of a light that came from above hit my heart something that struck me I was so awake vividly watching it and something struck it and I felt like wow this was some kind of an answer just because I've spent all these weeks and months just crying and being with the Messenger of Allah that is Allah responding to me Allahu Alam it doesn't matter what matters is that when you and I embark in that way Allah purifies us he opens up ways for us I used to be an avid music listener I was addicted to music as a teenager, constant. Not allowed to listen to music in the house, but in my car, I had all the songs. And at that time, you know, you have millions of songs you can download on Spotify. At that time, we bought the cassettes. And they were expensive, like $10, $15 a piece. So it's very expensive when you buy a song. But I had all these songs in my car. But my parents said, in the house, no. You can do what you want outside, but not in the house. So I asked Allah, what is wrong with this music? What is wrong with it? I'm not a monster. When I listen to it, I bop my head. I drive a little fast once in a while. But it's, I'm not a monster. Why is it that I should be cognizant of this? Show me, Allah. Just a simple example. I don't, I'm not talking about music tonight, no time. But I embarked on questioning its integrity. I said, I will experiment. So I would listen to music, then I'd go home and watch myself. And I noticed I'm visibly annoyed. For small little petty things, I would get annoyed. Then I'd come back to my room and say, why did I get annoyed? I wonder if that music has me revved up. Then for one week, I stopped listening to music completely. I put all the cassettes away, no music. And I was calm, collected, more patient, more able to deal with problems. I said, I wonder if that thing is revving my brains up. So I started moving away from it. And one day, alhamdulillah, I took that step. First, I said, haram, I'm not listening to music anymore. I took all my cassettes and threw it in the closet. And something in my head says, you are lying. I said, why? He says, you put it in the closet. Because <laughs> tomorrow when your feeling comes back, you'll open it up. Huh? You're going to play it again. I said, you know what? That's true. I'm not committed. So I took it, put it in my trunk, and went to a dumpster. And I swear, I was sweating for 10 minutes. Just throwing the music cassette, I, I was like, do I really want to throw all these cassettes? I mean, this is like my lifeline. But I took it and I dumped it. And subhanAllah, since that day, I have no love for music. I listen to it when I hear it. It reminds me of the past because music connects you with historical events. You know, you remember the past, right? But no more. What happened after that? My mind suddenly started becoming clearer. My absorption level increased. My ability to memorize Quran was rapid. Within a short time, I was able to memorize verses of the Quran. I said, wow, that thing I was listening to was clogging me up with innuendos and ideas that were creating fantasies that made me sad and depressed. For music takes you into the world of fantasy. And it's a very problematic issue because it affects your mind and thought. So I said, if I'm going to purify myself, I need to move away from this if I'm going to reach that state. Now, music actually distracts me and disturbs me. When I hear it, I say, turn it off. It distracts me. I don't like it. Silence is better. Quran is better. Dua is better. Hymns are better. Even, even a little bit of that you know, background music, piano, that's okay. But even that, sometimes too much, starts to bother me. But Quran, Dua, or if meditation of silence is just elegant in itself. So please, I advise us all, if we are very much into it, be careful if we wonder why we don't have much concentration. Some people say, no, music helps me concentrate. No, it does not. There is no, there is no evidence whatsoever that music, by the way, calms anybody down. 
Okay, music actually is a distractor. That's why dentists use it. That's why they use it in certain environments. It's not a calming agency, it's a distractor. Because if it was calming, when you turn it off, you should feel very good. Why is it when somebody turns off the music, you get very annoyed? If it was calming, the calmness should continue. But it doesn't. You find you get annoyed, visibly annoyed, because you were in the world of distraction, which distracted you now, and therefore you, you don't have the bearing to bear it anymore. This was just a quick footnote. I remembered it. I said, let me say it. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Allah in Surah Al Baqarah says, Ya yuladin amr sta'inu bis sabri wa salah. O mankind, seek help through patience and prayer. In Allah ma'as sabirin. Indeed, Allah is with the patient ones. Now, this conversation of patience is the holistic result of an individual who has come to terms with their purpose in life. One of the hardest things to practice is patience. And Allah is proving to us in the Quran that it is such an honorable state that when you and I exercise patience, that Allah is with us. There's a difference when you and I are with Allah. But when Allah is with us, it's a whole different position. In Allah ma'as sabirin. Indeed, Allah is with the patient ones. With the patient ones. And Allah says, Wa bashir as sabirin. Give good news to the patient ones. Alladina idha asabat hum musiba. That when they have difficulty, they say, We are from Allah. We return to Allah. Now Khadija bint Khwailid, the wife of the Messenger of Allah, was the ultimate example of a woman who practiced this verse of the Quran in its highest stature and form. And tonight on the 10th of Ramadan, three years before the migration of the Prophet in the year 619 AD, she left this world. Brief history. She was the same age, by the way. Some people say she was 40 years of age and the Messenger was 25 these are concoctions of history that were not correct. I even asked Sayyid Asghar Razwi, who has written a book on Khadija al-Kubra. I said, what is your opinion? He said, we know for a fact that Khadija was a young woman, but they concocted history to make her look old because they were so jealous of her because the love the messenger had for Khadija was so great that in annals of history, in all hadith, the messenger said, Khadija and I will be in paradise together. He mentioned this in all schools of thought. All Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah as well as the Shia agreed that the Prophet said this. But he never said that about any of his other wives. He did not say that I will be with this other wife in paradise and with that other wife. Only Khadija and him will be in paradise to show you the exclusivity of who she is. Now, I want you also to understand that Khadija was the first woman to accept Islam once the Messenger received his revelation. You know? Uh, when you listen to Christian or what we call Orientalists write about the Prophet, unfortunately there's so much trashy history about the Holy Prophet and I want to correct that in, the, in these lectures. You find that they say when the messenger was in the cave and Jibreel comes to him and it happened in Rajab as you know, when Jibreel comes and says, Iqra! The 96th chapter was given to the Prophet to recite. He says, Ma ana biqari. Now there are two meanings, I don't know how to read. Or what should I read? What should I read? Now, Jibreel is telling the messenger to recite satanic verses written by Salman Rushdie. You find, how did he get that? Because he's an ex-Muslim and he read the history written by the enemies of Islam within Islam saying that the messenger thought it was the devil talking to him. The messenger of Allah was born a messenger. When he was a child, Jibreel was talking to him. Allah says, Alam yajidika yatiman fa'awa wa jadaka dalan fahada. Were you not an orphan and we protected you? And you were lost and you were guided. He was lost in the valley as a child. Abdul Muttali was looking for him. And a camel guides him. And he sees him speaking with a young man. The Holy Prophet is sitting in the valley talking to a young man. And Abdul Muttali realizes this young man that he's talking to, a handsome young man, was Jibreel. The Prophet spoke to Jibreel at a young age. Buhaira, who was a Christian monk, when the Prophet was traveling, knew this is the Prophet. And the Prophet knew he's the Prophet because there was a cloud that was moving with him in all directions that he went. He had a sign on his back. It was not a secret. So when Jibreel is meeting him at the age of 40 on the cave, in the cave, he's not surprised that the devil is talking to me. 
But my God, the shaitan have a reason to concoct silly stories that become part and parcel of our historical artifacts that have no bearing within the truth that the messenger of Allah declared his prophethood early on but in public when he declared it he was not confused they say oh the messenger was so confused he ran you know to Waraqa ibn Nawfal who was a Muahid Christian at that time who was the uncle of Khadija and he consoles him don't worry that was God talking to you the prophet thought the devil spoke to him he was so confused he was suicidal I mean these stories are so false but we need to read them and understand them for this is the furthest from the Quran the messenger of Allah was chosen by Allah born a prophet protected he had no wild ideas I've read hadith way he was in Mecca you know taking care of animals and then there was a wedding and he wanted to go and do some haram and Allah put him to sleep he says twice Allah put me to sleep and then when Jibreel came, he came and took out two black spots from his heart. These are all stories written by people who ate too much and drank too much. It's not true. The messenger of Allah was commissioned before even Adam was created. The messenger of Allah existed even before Adam was created. In fact, the, the nur of Adam, his, his existence is from the light of the Holy Prophet. You and I come from the light of the Holy Prophet. The first thing Allah created was the light of the Holy Prophet. So please understand this historical fact. Now, what you find is when the messenger comes, he comes to Khadija, she immediately embraces him and says, Allah has spoken to you. Now he marries her, by the way. How does he marry her? She was an erudite woman. She was also an aristocrat. Her father was the wealthiest man in Mecca. They say her wealth was so much, there was an army that carried her wealth. That's how rich she was as a human being, as an entrepreneur. And I want you to understand history. At that time, females were considered second-class citizens. Sons would inherit their father's wives. Think about it. They would inherit them. Okay, they would sell them sometimes, they would get rid of them. And to make things even worse, when a baby girl was born, Quran even mentions that you are going to kill a young child because it's a female, because you're afraid of poverty, because you're afraid that uh, the society will look down on you because you give birth to a girl. And the father would take this little girl who's happy, thinking that her father is going to play with her in the desert, and while he's digging, in that sand, she's playing with him, thinking father is playing with him, when in fact he's digging her grave, and he throws her in there, and he buries her, and she stops breathing while she's holding on to his fingers. This kind of ignominy shaitan was present at that time, that Khadija represented womanhood. She was the ultimate sky of womanhood. She was an entrepreneur. She was wise. She was indomitable. She was strong. She was unafraid of anybody. She was running an empire, a business that was larger than all businesses put together. All of us should take a lesson that she actually financed Islam. We think men are the financiers. It was a woman who financed Islam. It was a woman who established the initial foundations of Islam with her wealth and herself. I want us to understand Khadija very briefly that when Allah says, Ya yeah, Yunasi na khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha, we made you into male and female, nations and tribes, lita'arafu, inna akramakum in the Allah yatqakum. The most honorable to Allah is atqakum. She was the ultimate one who had taqwa. She was so powerful in faith that she embraced the messenger. And history says in the early days of Mecca, when the messenger had declared Islam that only him, his wife Khadija and Ali ibn Abi Talib, three of them used to do salah by the Kaaba, near the Kaaba. And they were seen praying, only three people in the early days. The faith this woman had, she exhausted all her wealth. She gave the messenger all her wealth. She was so rich that by the time she passes away, she had no money even for her own shroud. She gave it all away. How many women do we know in the world today that should traverse in that? How many men do we know that traverse this direction. We're all very selfish in our own ways, typically, which is not a good thing. Let us be more generous in doing things for Allah. And Khadija was such a woman that she stood by the Messenger of Allah for, for all the 10 years 
All the 10 years in Mecca, she was with him. Then, as you know, the people of Mecca decided to create an agreement to banish the Banu Hashim. Now, very quick point here, then I'm going to end. You find the Banu Hashim were banished. The Meccans wanted Abu Talib to bring the Prophet to them so that they could kill him. And Hazrat Abu Talib, as you know, by the way, was the Imam of the time. He was a silent Imam. Anybody who says that Abu Talib was a disbeliever, does not know history, is concocting a lie against a man of God. And he was the most honorable, powerful protector of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. It's logical that the Banu Hashim, Abdul Muttalib, the, the father of Abu Talib, and Abdullah, as you know, Abu, Abu Talib and Abdullah had the same mother. Imam Ali's uh, father, uh, Imam Ali's grandmother, and the Holy Prophet's grandmother were the same. Same. They come from one root. Abdul Muttalib had many children, as you know, right? But you find that these two were the closest together. The jealousy that came out of that because of the proximity of Imam Ali salam, to the Prophet in blood as well as in spirit continues until today. So Khadija was very close and Abu Talib was the protector. So these two were the protectors of the Prophet. In that year, 619, Abu Talib died a few, three months after Khadija. And when Khadija died, the Prophet cried. And Abu Talib, when he left, he cried a lot. And then all the onslaught started against the messenger, which led him to be suffering for three more years until Allah commanded him to migrate from Mecca to Medina for protection. Khadija gave all her wealth, and she loved the messenger, and she joined him in the shape of Abu Talib. Now Khadija lived in a palace. She was very wealthy. But when there was a boycott against the messenger, because he was a Muslim, because he was a prophet, they wanted to kill him. They asked Abu Talib, give us your nephew or else we will do something to you. Abu Talib said, under no circumstance am I going to give you Muhammad. In fact, Abu Talib was so protective of the Holy Prophet, so protective, that when he took refuge in the shape of Abu Talib, which is a ravine, it's a valley, which he owned, and he took it there because Mecca had boycotted the Banu Hashim. I want you to remember, in history, those who became caliphs from other tribes, were there. And I want you to know that not a single one visited the Messenger of Allah for the three years when he was struggling and suffering. They didn't even take one morsel of food nor a glass of water to the Messenger of Allah. And they were already Muslims. We talk great things about some people that came in history. They never visited the Messenger of Allah while he was in, in Shaybu Abu Talib. Abu Talib suffered. They said Khadija suffered so much. He used to boil leaves and bark if there was water to feed the children because they were crying. They used to carry rocks around their bellies because they had no food because they were boycotted by the Meccans. And you know who used to bring food to them in the night when they could? Th three or four pagans, four mushrikeen who were not Muslims. In the night they used to put their lives in danger and pass through all the valleys and ensure that food would enter the valley to feed the families. Khadija gave up her palace and she went into this valley and she remained with the messenger and she developed such illness that when the, by the way, the same four who used to feed decided to rise in Mecca and made a stink about this uh, boycott agreement and they saw that it was all eaten by the worms and only Bismi Ta'ali was left and then they ste stepped on it, crushed it and said, this agreement is nullified and the messenger of Allah and Abu Talib were allowed to come back to, Me to Mecca. As soon as they came back, Khadija had suffered so much in this pain that she was no longer able to survive. And soon thereafter, she passed away. She died. She left this world as a believer, as a strong woman who supported the messenger unflinchingly. And the messenger married nobody. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this, that Allah says, An-Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusim wa azwaju ummahatum. You find that the messenger is greater right on the believers and the wives are like your mothers. Here, quick point I want to make. I don't have time, but I must make this point. People say that the wives of the Prophet are our mothers. They're not our mothers. When Allah says, Azwajuhum, I mean, Azwajuhum Mahatum, the, he, he, the wives of the Prophet are your mothers, it means you cannot marry them. They are haram. Once they get married to the Prophet, even if the Prophet divorces them, they are forbidden forever 
to be married to anybody. This was the condition of marrying a prophet. Otherwise, no, because if that's the case, then the prophet should be a father. But Allah says, ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم The Prophet is father of nobody. So Khadija was the ultimate Ummul Mu'mineen and he remained with her until her death and then thereafter the messenger married a few of those wives for political, for amalgamation of what we call to bring the tribes together. And the messenger buries her and when Allah says, وَبَشِّرِ sabirin, Give good news to the patient ones. We say, this was definitely Khadija is one of them. And Allah, the Holy Prophet said to Khadija when she was about to die, that, oh Khadija, Allah has built the most magnificent place for you in paradise, awaiting you. Now, if you look, by the way, in Surah Tahrim 66, Allah gives example of two kinds of women. And interestingly, the first kind, which was, which will be told to go to hell, were both wives of prophets. So Allah said, Darab Allah ladina kafum ra'ata nuhin wa ra'ata lut. كَانَ تَحْتَ عَبْدَيْنِ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا صَالِحَيْنِ فَخَانَتَاهُمَا فَرَمْ يُغْنِيَ عَنْهُمَا مِنَ اللَّهِ شَيْئًا وَقِيلَ دْخُلَ النَّارَ مَعَ الدَّاخِلِينَ Allah gives an example of Surah the last two verses. He says, Allah sets forth an example of those who disbelieve the wife of Nuh and the wife of Lut. Nuh and Lut were both wives of the Prophet. Quran said, look at who these two were. They were both evil wives. They were evil. Compare this with Khadija, who was on the opposite spectrum. And prophets do have evil wives. They are not given immunity once they become the wives of the prophet. Meaning, paradise is not guaranteed for the wives of the prophet. In fact, Allah says, if you maintain goodness, we will reward you twice, O wives of the prophet. But if you misbehave, we will punish you twice as much. That's in the Quran. Now, Allah says, who are they? He said, they were both under our two righteous servants, but they acted treacherously towards them, so they availed them not against Allah. And it was said, enter both fire with those who enter. Two wives of the Prophet in the Quran who will be told to enter hell on judgment day. Then, Final point here. Who was this? Asiya bin Muzahim, the wife of Fir'aun. Allah mentions her as the great woman that she struggled to raise Musa. And Fir'aun, by the way, executes her. She became Shahida. She was killed by Fir'aun. Actually, Fir'aun took a rock, a huge rock, and threw it on her. His soldiers threw it on her, and she became martyred. She died. So Allah is explaining, look at this woman, how great she was, that she raised Musa, and she was a believer married to a tyrant Fir'aun. But look, she, as she's about to die, she said, my Lord, build for me something there, for I have worshipped you because of that, right? And Allah promises that she will enter paradise. And then, وَمَرِيَ بْنَةَ عِمْرَانَ الَّتِي أَحْسَنَتْ فَرْجَهَا فَنَفَخْنَ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِنَا وَصَدَّقَتْ بِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ وَكُتُبِهِ وَكَانَتْ مِنَ الْقَانِتِينَ Final point here in this verse. And Maryam, the daughter of Imran, who was the mother of Jesus, who guarded her chastity, so we breathed into her our inspiration, and she accepted the truth of the words of her Lord and his books, and she was of the obedient ones. So Allah gives example of two great women and two terrible women. Point here is, the two terrible women were both wives of prophets. But Khadija was uniquely different. So please, all of us, let's be careful. When we hear stories about wives of prophets, let's not give total immunity to them just because they're wives of the prophet. Follow the Quran, and the Quran teaches us the principles of who to follow, who to love, who to obey, and how to obey. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbana khfil lana wa li khwanina alladhina sabakuna bil iman. Wa la taj'al fi qulubina ghilla lilladhina amanu. Rabbana innaka raufur rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تعز بها الإسلام وأهله وتذل بها النفاق وأهله وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى طاعتك والقادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة Three times أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء All of us together please in this month of Ramadan بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء 
برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين صلوات على محمد وعلى محمد Thank you, Hajj Hassanin, for that amazing lecture. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to get your attention for 10 seconds here. Tomorrow, 11.30, so after the English lecture, we'll have a suhoor with Hajj Hassanin. It'll be inside the masjid, inshallah, 11.30. It's a Q&A and a suhoor as well. So you don't want to miss out on that. With that being said, we will have the Arabic lecture with Sheikh Dr. Basim Jawad after three loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. على حب سيدتنا مولاتنا خديجة عليها السلام صلوا على محمد وآل محمد على حب ابنتها فاطمة الزهراء عليها السلام رحم الله من أعادها ثانية تعجيلا فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان عجل الله فرجه الشريف بأعلى أصواتكم ثالثة <تصفيق> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله وعلى آل بيتك الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك وعلى زوجتك أم المؤمنين خديجة عليها السلام قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم كملا من الرجال كثير ولم يكمل من النساء إلا أربع مريم ابنة عمران وآسيا بنت مزاحم وخديجة ابنة خويلد وفاطمة بنت محمد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي 
اللهم انطقني بالهدى والهمني التقوى على حب مولاتنا خديجة ارفعوا أصواتكم بالصلاة على محمد وآل محمد الإخوة الأعزاء الأخوات الكريمات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته صبيحة هذه الليلة كانت صبيحة مؤلمة على قلب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم إذ رحلت إلى الرفيق الأعلى رفيقة دربه في الجهاد وأم أولاده وأم فاطمة ابنته وحبيبته خديجة الكبرى صلوات الله وسلامه عليها ونحن من هذا المكان نرفع آيات العزاء لمولانا صاحب العصر والزمان بذكرى وفاة جدته خديجة عليها أفضل الصلاة والسلام الحديث عن خديجة عليها السلام أيها الأحبة هو حديث عن التضحية حديث عن الجهاد في سبيل الله حديث عن الطهارة حديث عن العفة حديث عن الحكمة حديث عن أقصى آية أقصى ما, يب ما أمكن أن يبذله إنسان في سبيل الله سبحانه وتعالى هذه الليلة أيها الأحبة نتحدث عن هذه السيدة الطاهرة التي كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم يحبها حبا عظيما وكان يقول بأبي هو وأمي لقد رزقت حبها النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم يعتز بهذه المحبة لخديجة ويعتبرها رزقا من الله سبحانه وتعالى دعونا في بداية هذه المحاضرة أيها الأحبة وهذا الحديث عن مولاتنا خديجة نتحدث عن مقامها عند الله سبحانه وتعالى ومقامها عند النبي صلى الله عليه وآله ومقامها عند أهل البيت عليهم السلام حتى نتعرف عن كثب مكانة هذه السيدة العظيمة عند الله سبحانه وتعالى في صحيح البخاري هذه الرواية روها أهل السنة في صحيح البخاري أتى جبرائيل إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وآله فقال يا رسول الله هذه خديجة قد أتت معها إناء فيه إدام أو طعام أو شراب فإذا هي أتتك فقرأ عليها من ربها ومني السلام وبشرها ببيت في الجنة لا صخب فيه ولا نصب رواية مماثلة عند الشيعة يرويها الإمام الباقر عليه السلام عن أبي سعيد الخدري يقول عن النبي صلى الله عليه وآله إن جبرائيل قال لي ليلة أسري بي حين رجعت إلى السماء حين رجعت إلى الأرض وقلت يا جبرائيل انظروا أيها الأحبة وقلت يا جبرائيل هل لك من حاجة الآن رجعنا من هذه الرحلة الطويلة يا جبرائيل رحلة المعراج هل لك حاجة فأقضيها لك يا جبرائيل فقال نعم حاجتي أن تقرئ خديجة من الله ومني السلام فأخبرها النبي صلى الله عليه وآله عندما دخل إلى خديجة أبلغها سلام الله وسلام جبرائيل عليه السلام فقالت 
ان الله هو السلام ومنه السلام وعليه السلام وعلى جبرائيل السلام ممن السلام من الله سبحانه وتعالى اي سلام هذا هو ذلك السلام الذي يقول الله عز وجل عنه في سوره القدر سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر هو ذلك السلام الذي يقول الله سلام قولا من رب رحيم هو ذلك السلام سلام عليكم طبتم فادخلوها خالدين النبي صلى الله عليه وآله أمره الله أن يعتزل خديجة أربعين يوما تهيئة لانعقاد نطفة فاطمة الزهراء عليها السلام فالنبي اعتزل خديجة لا يأتي إلى بيت خديجة أربعين يوم تصوروا امرأة تحب رسول الله هذه المحبة العظيمة ويغيب عنها شخص النبي صلى الله عليه وآله فإذا بالنبي يرسل عمار بن ياسر يقول له حتى تعرف مقام خديجة عند الله يا خديجة لا تظني أن انقطاعي عنك هجر ولا قلا ولكن ربي عز وجل أمرني بذلك لينفذ أمره أمره فلا تظني يا خديجة إلا خيرا فإن الله ليباهي بك كرام ملائكته كل يوم مرارا كل يوم عدة مرات الله يباهي كرام الملائكة بمن؟ بخديجة عليها السلام عندما عرج الله سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله اختار الله بيت خديجة لكي يكون هو المنطلق لهذه الرحلة المباركة للنبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم هذا مقامها عند الله عز وجل أما مقامها عند النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم قصتها مع النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وهي ليست ببعيدة نسبا عن النبي هي تلتقي مع النبي في جده قصي قصتها مع النبي صلى الله عليه وآله بدأت أيها الأحبة عندما اقترح أبو طالب عليه السلام أن يذهب رسول الله إلى خديجة ويتاجر معها فقيل أن هناك نوع من المضاربة يعني مشاركة في التجارة خديجة عليها السلام لاشتهار رسول الله بهذا العنوان الصادق الأمين هذه القافلة تلك السنة عهدت بها إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وخادمها مملوكها ميسر كان رجل كبير في السن قالت له من أنا قال لها أنت مولاتي وسيدتي فقالت من الآن سيدك ومولاك هو محمد بن عبد الله فاسمع له وأطع لكن أريد أن أطلب منك طلبا إذا أنت ذهبت مع محمد في هذه الرحلة إلى الشام للتجارة بعد أن ترجع أخبرني بدقائق الأمور ماذا حصل لكم في السفر وحصلت عدة أشياء وكرامات لرسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم نختار منها ثلاثة عندما تحركت القافلة وكانت الشمس حارة يقول ميسر يخبر خديجة بعد أن رجع من سفره يخبرها بهذه الأمور يقول لها عندما تحركت القافلة وكانت الشمس حارة وإذا بغمامة تظلل على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله ولا زالت هذه الغمامة تظلل على رسول الله حتى رجعنا إلى مكة مرة أخرى هذا أمر أول أمر ثاني في طريقهم إلى الشام كان هناك راهب 
في مكان معين من سنين ينتظر قدوم النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم هناك شجرة نزل عندها النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم ليرتاح فإذا برجل راهب قال من من هنا سأل ميسر فقال هذا محمد ابن عبد الله وهذا سيدي فقال هذه الشجرة لا ينام عندها إلا نبي أو وصي نبي أنا من زمن طويل أنتظر هذا الإنسان وهذا الرجل الذي له كرامة عند الله سبحانه وتعالى لأنه قد قرأ في كتب عيسى في, في الكتب السابقة لعيسى عليه السلام أن هناك نبي وهو نبي آخر الزمان فتعرف رأى ختم النبوة في كتف النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم الأيمن وأما القصف طبعا هذه الشجرة بمجرد أن جلس عندها النبي صلى الله عليه وآله اخضرت وأثمرت وأما العلامة الثالثة فكان الربح الوفير في تجارة خديجة في تلك السنة أيها الأحبة خديجة صلوات الله وسلامه عليها كانت ترقب عن كثب خلق النبي صلى الله عليه وآله فلذلك أعجبت بأخلاق رسول الله وروي أن صاحبة لها اسمها نفيسة طلبت منها أن تذهب إلى رسول الله وتقترح عليه أن يخطب خديجة وأن يتقدم لخطبة خديجة عليها السلام وجاء أبو طالب وأعمام النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وتقدموا إلى خديجة وتم الزواج المبارك وكان عمر النبي صلى الله عليه وآله خمسة وعشرين سنة واختلفت الروايات في عمر خديجة صلوات الله وسلامه عليها وكان النبي يحب خديجة حبا شديدا أيها الأحبة يوم من الأيام كان النبي صلى الله عليه وآله أحيانا إذا ذبح شاة خصص جزء من هذه الشاة يقول ابعثوا بهذا لصاحبة خديجة وهذا بعد سنين من موت خديجة عليها السلام فلامته بعض أزواجه فقال والله إني لأحب من كان يحبها ونحن نشهدك يا رسول الله أنا نحب خديجة عائشة زوج النبي كانت تقول لا يكاد النبي يخرج من البيت تصوروا بعد سنين طوال النبي تقول لا يكاد النبي يخرج من البيت حتى يذكر خديجة 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 حتى فغرت من ذلك فقلت له ما تزال تذكر خديجة وهي عجوز وقد أبدلك الله خيرا منها تصور هذا النبي الذي هو على خلق عظيم رسول ليس من السهل أن يغضب النبي صلى الله عليه وآله هو حليم تقول الرواية فغضب النبي صلى الله عليه وآله حتى اهتز شعر رأسه الشريف قال لا والله ما أبدلني الله خيرا منها آمنت بي إذ كفر الناس إذ كفر بي الناس وصدقتني إذ كذبني الناس وواستني بمالها إذ حرمني الناس ورزقني الله منها الولد دون غيرها من النساء كيف ينسى النبي؟ خديجة عليها السلام يوم فتح مكة فتح مكة في السنة الثامنة للهجرة أيها الأحبة تقريبا بعد عشر إلى 11 سنة من وفاة السيدة خديجة عليها السلام النبي فتح مكة وين النبي أقام 
أمر بأن تنصب له قبة يعني مثل المكان الخيمة عند قبر خديجة عليها السلام في فتح مكة أمر بأن تنصب له قبة عند قبر خديجة صلوات الله وسلامه عليه يوم من الأيام خط النبي أربع خطوط على الأرض فقالوا يا رسول قال أتدرون ما هذه في مضمون الرواية قالوا ما هذه يا رسول الله فقال سيدة نساء أهل الجنة أربع آسيا بنت مزاحم ومريم ابنة عمران وخديجة ابنة خويلد وفاطمة ابنة محمد صلوا على محمد وآل محمد إذا لها شأن عظيم عند النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم أمير المؤمنين أيضا كان يعز خديجة لماذا؟ خديجة كانت لأمير المؤمنين مثابة الأم وعلي بن أبي طالب عمره ست سنوات انتقل من بيت أبيه وأمه ليسكن مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وخديجة عليهما وآلهما السلام الإمام الحسن المجتبى أهل البيت كانوا يفخرون بخديجة عليها السلام الإمام الحسن المجتبى كان يقول وكنت أنا أشبه الناس بخديجة وكان يعير معاوية يقول له وجدتك وجدتي خديجة وجدتك فتيلة والإمام الحسين يوم كربلاء كان يقول فإني ابن بنت نبيكم وجدتي خديجة زوجة نبيكم وكان يقول لأعدائه الذين اصطفوا لقتاله أن أناشدكم شدكم الله هل تعلمون أن جدتي خديجة ابنة خويلد أول نساء هذه الأمة إسلاما قالوا اللهم نعم عندما نزور الإمام الحسين ماذا نقول هذه الزيارة مروية عن الإمام المعصوم السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة الزهراء السلام عليك ماذا يا ابن خديجة الكبرى لها مقام عظيم عند الله سبحانه وتعالى وعند أهل البيت عليهم أفضل الصلاة والسلام السؤال أيها الأحبة بما استحقت خديجة هذا المقام العظيم عند الله عز وجل هل فقط لأنها زوج النبي ويعطي هذا مؤهل أن تكون من سيدات نساء أهل الجنة وحقيقة خديجة مجهولة القدر حتى في مجتمع مجتمعنا مجهولة القدر وإلا من يقول أن فلانة هي أفضل نساء النبي كيف نستطيع أن نقارن خديجة بأي امرأة أخرى للنبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم بماذا استحقت خديجة هل لأنها زوج رسول الله لا طبعا لأنه ممكن أن تكون زوجة نبي وتكون عاصية ضرب الله مثلا الذين آمنوا امرأة فرعون امرأة امرأة نوح لا ضرب الله مثلا الذين كفروا امرأة امرأة نوح ولوط للذين كفروا كانوا أعداء لنوح ولوط ليس بالضرورة أن تكون زوجة نبي أنها مطهرة أو أنها معصومة من الخطأ فأيها الأحبة هذا ليس بأمر يعني يستحق بأن تقدس خديجة عليه السلام ليس لهذا لوحده إذا هناك عدة أمور كانت عند خديجة عليه السلام أولها البصيرة خديجة استطاعت أن تشخص بشكل دقيق حقيقة شخصية النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وأن ترى النور النبوي في وجه النبي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم ولذلك تقدمت هي واقترحت أن يتقدم النبي صلى الله عليه وآله لخطبته عندما نزل الوحي على رسول الله ورجع النبي إلى خديجة قالت له والله إن الله لا يخذلك 
إنك لتصل الرحم وتقري الضيف انظر إلى بصيرة هذه المرأة هناك لقب خاص كانت تلقب به السيدة خديجة عليها السلام لقب الطاهرة هذا اللقب أيها الأحبة ما كان يعني لقب من قبل أهل البيت عليهم السلام في يعني بعد الإسلام بعد مجيء النبي بالإسلام وتبليغ رسالة الإسلام لا هذا اللقب لقب الطاهرة أعطي لخديجة قبل البعثة بسنين طويلة هذا العنوان الطاهرة إذا ذكرت خديجة قيل هذه المرأة الطاهرة هذا شيء يدعو إلى التأمل أيها الأحبة خديجة مع ذلك المجتمع في مجتمع مكة الذي كان فيه الفسق والفجور والانحلال في بعض أماكنه إلا أن هذه المرأة وقفت عنوانا للقداسة والطهارة أيها الأحبة لذلك هذه قدوة خديجة قدوة للمرأة المؤمنة إحنا مو والله عذر أننا نحن في أمريكا أن أو في الغرب أن تتخلى المؤمنة عن حجابها يجب على المؤمنة أن تعتز بحجابها كما كانت خديجة عليها الصلاة والسلام النقطة الثالثة تضحية خديجة من أجل الإسلام تعرفون خديجة كانت من أغنى يعني لعلها من أغنى أغنياء الجزيرة العربية حتما كانت من أغنى أهل مكة وكانت تجار مكة يضاربون بأموال خديجة يأتلون يأخذون من خديجة أموال ويتاجرون ثم يعطونها مثلا نسبة من الربح فكانت غنية جدا صلوات الله وسلامه عليها خديجة تصوروا أنها بذلت كل ما تملك من أجل الإسلام أصلا بمجرد أن تزوجت النبي قبل البعثة بخمسة عشر سنة عندما كان النبي بعث وعمره أربعون عندما كان النبي عمره خمسة وعشرون طلبت عندما تزوجها النبي طلبت من ابن عمها ورق ابن نوفل أن يقف عند الصفا أو المروة وينادي أيها الناس إن خديجة قد وهبت نفسها ومالها وما تملك لمحمد بن عبد الله ولذلك ترى الإسلام النبي يقول الإسلام قام على ثلاث هذا الدين العظيم قام على ثلاثة على مال خديجة وعلى دفاع أبي طالب وعلى سيف علي بن أبي طالب عليه السلام هؤلاء الثلاثة هم, هم الذين أقاموا الإسلام قام الإسلام على هؤلاء الثلاثة خديجة عليها أفضل الصلاة والسلام هي بمالها جهز النبي القافلة التي ذهبت إلى الحبشة بقيادة جعفر الطيار تصوروا أيها الأحبة امرأة بهذا الثراء العظيم جدا وإذا بها في شعب أبي طالب تعاني من شدة الجوع إلى درجة أنها كانت تأكل أوراق الشجر من شدة الجوع كانت تأكل أوراق الشجر من شدة الجوع قدمت كل ما تملك في سبيل الله سبحانه وتعالى ولذلك أحبتي هذا مثال لنا نحن كل واحد يقول ماذا أستفيد نحن لماذا خديجة ملهمة لنا أيها الأحبة هذه السيدة الطاهرة تقضى بها الحاجات سلام الله عليها أم الزهراء فاطمة زوجة النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم قدوة لنا أيها الأحبة شلون قدوة لنا أحبتي قدوة لنا في الإنفاق في سبيل الله قدوة لنا في أن نحمل هم الإسلام إحنا عادة بعض البعض ما أقول الكل طبعا جزا الله المتبرعين ألف خير في المراكز الإسلامية وحقيقة الذين يتبرعون ويدعمون 
بهم يقوم الإسلام هنا في الغرب وبهم يقوم ذكر آل محمد في الغرب لكن البعض إذا جاء وتبرع للمركز أو للمؤسسة الإسلامية يعتبر نفسه صاحب فضل مو على المؤسسة صاحب فضل على رب العالمين هذا عجيب هذا وين الله سبحانه وتعالى يقبل عمله ويقبل ويقبل صدقته لذلك الإخلاص في العمل أيها الأحبة بالذات العمل الإسلامي العمل الإسلامي أيا كانت نوع الخدمة إنفاق أي كان نوع الإنفاق يجب أن يكون خالصا لوجه الله سبحانه وتعالى هذا أولا ثانيا يجب أن نتحرك من منطلق المسؤولية أيها الأحبة قبل عدة سنين كنت في أحد المدن في, في أمريكا هنا كان عندنا مركز طلبت من الشباب قلت اجمعوا من هذا الشاب عشرين ومن هذا عشرين ومن هذا عشرين ومن هذا عشرة قالوا لأحدهم نريد منك مساهمة عشرين دولار كان يأتي هو وزوجته وأولاده فعندما طلبنا منه ذلك قال والله أنا هاي مو مسؤوليتي إن أنا أرفع لكم عشرين بالشهر عجيب مسؤوليتك إنك تروح وتسهر في الأماكن الغير جيدة وتشرب الأشياء الغير مباحة ولكن مو مسؤوليتك أن تساهم في دعم رسالة الإسلام مو مسؤوليتك أن تساهم في ذكر أهل البيت عليهم السلام لذلك أحبتي يجب يعني الدال على الخير كفاعل إذا أنت لم تستطع فاطلب من غيرك أن يساهم أن يتبرع أن يدعم هذه المراكز الإسلامية فلها فضل كبير حقيقة في بقاء الإسلام وبقاء ذكر أهل البيت صلوات الله وسلامه عليهم أجمعين بعد خديجة عليها السلام كان لها دور كبير أيها الأحبة في الدعم النفسي لرسول الله تعرفون ترى أنا يعني شوية يعني يمكن البعض لا يعرف رجال الدين المتصدين مثلا مثل الشيخ محمد علاه حفظه الله وبقية رجال الدين المتصدين في المنطقة البعض يظن يعني أن هؤلاء يعني يرونهم مثلا في الإعلام وال والكلمات لكن لا يعلمون حقيقة ما يعانونه حقيقة من أجل من الكفاح والجهاد والسهر والتعب ل يعني لكي تجري الأمور في هذه المراكز على أتم وجه لذلك أيها الأحبة خديجة عليها السلام كانت داعما نفسيا لرسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله النبي كان يأتي يأتي والدماء تسيل من وجهه الشريف سلام الله عليه يأتي وقد تحمل من أذى قريش فيرى في بيته الصدر الحنون والقلب الحنون قلب خديجة صلوات الله وسلامه عليه عليها من اليوم الأول خديجة كانت تصلي خلف النبي وعلي عليه السلام يصلي أيضا مع خديجة خلف رسول الله عند الكعبة المشرفة سبع سنوات يقول أمير المؤمنين ما كان أحد غيري وخير وغير خديجة يصلي خلف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم بعد أيها الأحبة ونحن في نهاية المطاف خديجة اختارها الله عز وجل لتكون أما لسيدة نساء العالمين من الأولين والآخرين اختار الله خديجة فقال الله إنا أعطيناك الكوثر فصل لربك وانحر إن شانئك هو الأبتر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم كان يحب خديجة عليها السلام ولذلك في آخر حياة خديجة أيها الأحبة مرضت سلام الله عليها فحزن النبي صلى الله عليه وآله حزنا شديدا على مرض خديجة بأبيه وأمي وروي أنها قالت للنبي يا رسول الله عندي ثلاثة وصايا أما الوصية الأولى إن كنت قد قصرت انظروا المؤمن يشعر بالتقصير مع ما يقدم إن كنت 
قصرت في حقك أرجو أن تعفو عني فأجابها الرسول معاذ الله لم أر منك أي تقصير بل إنك بذلت قصارى جهودك وأتعبت نفسك في بيتي وصرفت أموالك وثروتك في سبيل الله قالت أما وصيتي الثانية إني خاف إني أخاف على ابنتي هذه وأشارت إلى الزهراء وكان عمرها خمس سنوات ستكون بعدي يتيمة وغريبة فلا تدعو نساء نسوة قريش يؤلمنها بكلام ولا يصفعنها على وجهها ولا يعنفنها وأن لا يسيء عليها أحد إليها أحد وأما وصيتي الثالثة إني أستحي أن أذكرها لك وسأقولها لابنتي فاطمة فإنها ستخبرها بك ستخبرها إياك ثم دعت ابنتها فاطمة لتدنو منها فلما دنت فاطمة عليها السلام همست خديجة في أذن ابنتها فاطمة وقالت لها يا قرة عيني قولي لأبيك رسول الله إن أمي تقول إني لأخشى هول القبر ووحشته ماذا نقول نحن وأرجو منك بأن تج وأرجو منك أن تجعل من الإزار التي الذي كنت مؤتز مؤتزرا به عند نزول الوحي عليك كفنا لي حتى يقيني من عذاب القبر ثم خرجت فاطمة من عندها لتنقل ما, لتنقل ما أوصتها أمها لأبيها فلما سمع رسول الله بذلك أرسل عباءته المقصود إلى خديجة ما أفرحها وأثلج صدرها قضت خديجة عليها السلام وامتلأ قلب رسول الله بالحزن والألم حتى أنه أطلق على ذلك العام عام الحزن أنا أقول أيها الأحبة كانت خديجة كانت فاطمة لها من العمر خمس سنوات عندما أوصتها أمها خديجة بتلك الوصايا أيضا الزهراء كانت لها ابنة كان لها من العمر خمس سنوات أوصتها أيضا بوصايا ماذا كانت وصية فاطمة عليها السلام لابنتها زينب سلام الله عليها كانت وصيتها قد نفذتها يوم العاشر من المحرم عندما خرج الحسين عليه السلام خروجه الأخير فإذا بصوت من خلفه ينادي يا حبيبي يا حسين ابن أمي يا حسين ارجع إلي يا ابن والدي رجع الإمام الحسين قال تنزل من على ظهر فرسك نزل الإمام الحسين قالت له اكشف لي عن نحرك وصدرك شمته في نحرك قبلته في صدره ليش تقول ليش قبلته في صدره وشمته في نحره لأن هذا النحر يأتي عليه الشمر بذلك السيف فيقطع نحر أبي عبد الله وهذا الصدر تطأه الخيول بحوافرها قبلته في صدره شمته في نحره ثم قالت أما توجهت إلى المدينة وقالت أما يا فاطمة قد أديت الأمانة قال أخي زينب أي أمانة قال تعلم يا أخي في اللحظات الأخيرة من حياة أمنا فاطمة قالت لي بني زينب إنه مني قبلتني في صدري شمتني في نحري وقالت بني إذا رأيت أخاك الحسين يوم كربلاء لا ناصر له ولا معين 
تقبليه في صدره وشميه في نحره اقول ساعد الله قلب زينب وهي تنظر الى ابي عبد الله على بوغاء كربلاء يا 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 تودعه وهي من على ظهر الناقه تقل اخويا لا تقول ما عندك مروه ولا تقول ضيعت الاخوه انا مو خوذتني يا حسين قوه اللهم صل على محمد واله اللهم انا نسالك بحق مولاتنا خديجه يا الله وشأنها العظيم عندك إلا ما غفرت ذنوبنا وسترت عيوبنا وقضيت حوائجنا للدنيا والآخرة يا رب العالمين أخواني الحاضرين أخواتي الحاضرات المستمعين المستمعات الكرام اللهم اقض حوائجهم فرج عنا وعنهم يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعلنا ممن تنتصر به لدينك ولا تستبدل بنا غيرنا يا رب العالمين اللهم أخلص نياتنا بحق محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم وفقنا في هذا الشهر لصيامه وتلاوة كتابك فيه يا رب العالمين اللهم اشف مرضانا ومرضى المؤمنين لا سيما المنظورين اللهم اقض لنا هذه الحاجة ربنا افتح بيننا وبين قومنا بالحق وأنت خير الفاتحين وإلى أرواح أمواتكم ولشفاء مرضاكم والمرضى المنظورين وإلى ضريحي ومقامي وروح مولاتنا خديجة الكبرى عليها السلام رحم الله من قرأ الفاتحة مع الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد Thank you, Sheikhna, for that presentation. Brothers and sisters, before we end tonight's program, we'll do a dua al hujjah And um, just a reminder that tomorrow we have the suhoor with Hajj Hassanin at 11.30. For those of you who have younger children, younger family that would like to attend, it'll be like a Q&A session. And something that I find very interesting, I feel like the skies, and if you go outside, it's raining, I feel like the skies are crying as well for say the Khadija on, on such a night all of Ramadan it hasn't really rained now out of nowhere at night it starts raining and it seems like a coincidence I don't know but uh, subhanallah exactly with that said inshallah we will conclude with a dua al hujjah بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Brothers and sisters, we'll see you in, inshallah inside the Mahdi Hall for refreshments and reminder that tomorrow the program starts at 9.30 with Dua Iftitah Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa